hope you found your way now to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Let me pray, and we'll begin our time in the Word together. Father in heaven, we thank you. We're grateful for this time and this place where we can gather together in your Word. We think, Lord, of our brother Saeed. We think of his wife and his children. And we pray, Lord, that you would show your grace and your mercy to them and that you would free him. We pray that every day that he remains imprisoned in that Iranian jail, that you would, Lord, that you'd keep him safe, that you'd guard his life, that you'd give him opportunity to be your witness and your man in that terrible situation. But Lord, we pray that you'd extend your grace and that you'd bring freedom to him once again. And Lord, we pray that you would give your grace and your blessing to us here this morning. Pour out your spirit upon us as we give attention to your word. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we continue on in our series, it's just our second study into this series through the Gospel of John, and we're beginning now at verse 19 of the first chapter. In the first 18 verses, we saw the Gospel writer John say some amazing, maybe even astounding things about Jesus. He told us that Jesus is eternal. He told us that Jesus is the logos, the divine intelligence behind everything in the universe. He told us that Jesus flat out is God. And he told us all these things, but you might say, what evidence is there to make such astounding statements about Jesus Christ? Yeah, it's a very logical question. You or I or any one of us, we can say that we are something or somebody. Somebody might say, well, I'm Napoleon. I'm Batman. I'm the President of the United States. You say, well, what evidence do you have to make such a claim? Well, this is one of the wonderful things about the Gospel of John, is the Gospel of John is very concerned to not just make statements about Jesus, but to back them up. And in one of the ways it backs them up is by giving eyewitness testimony to who Jesus is. And that's what our text this morning is filled with. It's filled with eyewitness testimony. People who saw Jesus up close and personal, and they said, this is who we say he is. So let's check it out, beginning now at verse 19. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And did you notice how it began in verse 19? Now this is the testimony of John. I told you that this section was going to give testimony of what people say about Jesus. And here the gospel writer John wants to make it very clear to us that what John the Baptist says is his testimony regarding who Jesus is. And what does he say? Well, before he gets to the testimony about who Jesus is, he has to clarify who he himself is. Because the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites, and they wanted to question John the Baptist. Now, I don't think this was a bad thing. These were the religious leaders. They had some sense of responsibility to say, who's teaching in our midst? This man, John, is becoming very popular with his work, baptizing people in the Jordan River. Who is he? Is he a false prophet? Is he a true prophet? I think that it was a fine thing for them to go and send a delegation out to question John the Baptist. So when they asked them, well, who are you? Are you the Messiah? Look at how he replies in verse 20. He says, I am not the Christ. He says it with great emphasis. Matter of fact, there's a subtlety here in the ancient Greek grammar that again, I don't really know because I don't know expert in the ancient Greek, but I know how to read people who are. And one of the commentators that I read this week pointed out that the emphasis in the grammar here goes something like this. He says, I am not the Christ, implying that somebody else was. And this is the exact thing. He's telling them, no, I'm not the Christ, but just you wait. I'm going to introduce him to you in just a few minutes. So they want to know, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? No, no, no. And so finally, with maybe a sense of exasperation, verse 22, they say, well, what do you say about yourself? Who are you? Tell us who you are. And look at his response beginning at verse 23. He said, I am the voice crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were with him were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, 
Why then do you baptize if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethbara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. So they bring the question back to John. Who are you? Tell us about yourself. And I love how he replies. He replies, number one, quoting scripture. Did you see that in verse 23? It says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, John explained his work. My work is to prepare the way of the Lord. I'm not the Christ. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet that was prophesied in Deuteronomy that would come. No, I am the one announced in Eli- by Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, the one crying out in the wilderness. I am preparing people for the coming king. My message is this, get cleaned up, the king is coming. Get ready for Jesus, get things in order. You know what I think is wonderful about this? The religious leaders kept wanting to know from John the Baptist, who are you, who are you? And you know what John replied with? With what he does. They wanted to make it all about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says this in such a wonderful way that's characteristic of the man. He's like, who I am doesn't really matter. Why do you keep asking that? Let me tell you about what God has given me to do. I am the one crying out in the wilderness, asking people to prepare themselves for the coming of the Messiah because he's right among them. Look at what he says there in verse 26. There stands one among you whom you do not know. Let me explain to you, religious leaders, it's as if John the Baptist said, I am not the focus of my work, but one who is already among you is the focus of my work. And my job is to prepare you and to prepare all Israel for the coming of that one. You know, there is something about the work of John the Baptist that is so precious and so forgotten by many who are preachers or leaders in the church today, it's so unbelievably Jesus-focused. For John, that's what it was all about. It was about putting the focus on Jesus, not upon himself. He, He said that famous line, he doesn't say it here, but he says it in another place in the Gospels. He says of Jesus in relation to himself, he says, he must increase and I must decrease. Anything that would mean less of me and more of Jesus is a great, great thing. John was nothing like a self-promoter, but what he was all about was being a Jesus promoter. And that's exactly what he's doing here. Well, he's given the great opportunity to promote Jesus starting now at verse 29. Look at it with me. We read, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. Now let me explain something. Just a little bit about the chronology. This is after Jesus has already been baptized. John does not record for us specifically when John the Baptist baptized Jesus. This is after the baptism of Jesus, and it's also after Jesus' temptations in the wilderness. So this is after that. Jesus comes back to John in the wilderness of Judea. Verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said... Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Could you imagine what that moment was like? There's John the Baptist, this frankly bizarre preacher out in the Judean wilderness. He's dressed in weird animal skins. His hair's crazy because he doesn't care much about his appearance. He he feeds himself on locusts and and, uh, wild honey. Which today people say, man, great, organic diet. Way to go, John the Baptist. (laughs) He's got this manner that totally puts people off, and he's rebuking religious leaders. There's just this whole flavor about uh, John the Baptist that is really remarkable and amazing. And this man comes, and he takes a look at Jesus coming to him, walking across the Judean desert. He sees him, he recognizes him, and he cries out this phrase. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you understand what he meant when he said that? He's referring to a concept that goes throughout the Old Testament, this concept of the Lamb of God. And he's saying, this is the one. This is the man who fulfills everything that the Lamb of God concept in the Old Testament pointed towards. He's the one. 
He's the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. He's the, uh, the animal slain in the garden of Eden to cover the nakedness of the very first sinners. He's the lamb that God himself would provide for Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. He's the Passover lamb for Israel. He's the lamb for the guilt offerings in the Levitical sacrifices and in Isaiah's terminology, he is the lamb led to slaughter, ready to be shorn. That's him, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. My friend, there's something remarkable in that. John announced to Jesus, although I don't think it was news to Jesus, but still I anticipate it might have been a jolt for him to hear it from the lips of John the Baptist. John announced to Jesus and to everyone who had listened, this man will die for the sin of the world. When you say the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, do you understand what it means? It means that Lamb is going to be sacrificed. His blood will be poured out on a holy altar before God because lambs didn't take away sin by skipping in the meadow. Lambs took away sin by shedding their own blood and giving up their own life. I imagine, and I hope it's not a vain imagination, but I imagine Jesus having to swallow hard when he heard those words from John the Baptist. It reminded him of something he knew. I must die to take away the sin of the world. By the way, when he says, take away, look at it there in that phrase. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's not just to bear, but the language there in the ancient original is very pointed. He takes it, away. In other words, Jesus just doesn't take the sin of the world and put it upon his shoulders, but he puts it upon his shoulder and he carries it away. He removes it. The guilt, the shame, the penalty of our sin, it's not just taken upon Jesus, but it's taken away by Jesus. And it is so big, so generous, so rich a provision that it is big enough for the whole world. The whole world. Do you realize that the work of Jesus on the cross is sufficient to save anyone who trusts in him? In this sense, it is inexhaustible. There's nobody who's going to come and come to Jesus and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we just had our last one. We're all out of forgiving power in the blood of Jesus. It doesn't happen that way. His work on the cross, his sacrifice for you and me, his work of being the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, it is inexhaustible. And friends, this is the great message that we preach. In this sense, each and every one of us is like John the Baptist. We're just pointing people to Jesus. We're just saying, behold, look at him. There he is, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. I remember hearing a story about Charles Spurgeon. I got a lot of stories about Charles Spurgeon. This one I like in particular. Spurgeon was one time going to preach in an auditorium where he'd never preached before. Now, please remember, in those days, they didn't have microphones. They didn't have sound systems. A, a, a preacher, a speaker, had to familiarize himself with the acoustics of the room if he was going to be effective. So Spurgeon was going to do a little practice speaking in the room to figure out, this is the corner I want to speak into. This is the corner I want to avoid. He had to get that feeling of the room. So he steps out on the platform in a darkened auditorium, and he just says about three or four times, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He repeats it three or four times, projecting his voice and getting a feel for the room. And then he's done and he walks away. He found out months later that there was a repairman, a workman there in the thing. And when he was bent down in fixing one of the seats, he heard Spurgeon say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world three or four times. And he trusted in Christ right then. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful statement? Because really, that statement alone is powerful enough to bring someone to a true and living faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. There he is. He takes away the sin of the world. Now going on, verse 30. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me because he was before me. And I did not know him but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified 
that this is the Son of God. I've seen it proven. I saw it proven when I baptized him. Because when I baptized him, there was a voice from heaven and the Holy Spirit coming upon him like a dove. I bear witness of this. Look at it there in verse 34. I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. He's more than a man. He's more than even a great man. No, we're not talking about somebody who belongs on Mount Rushmore among other great men of history. We're not talking about somebody who who could be listed in the history books, oh, this great general, that great king, this wonderful leader, this great inventor. No, no, no. All those great men and women of history, they have their place and we admire them. But this one, this one is different. This is the Son of God. Well, it would be enough for us just to consider the testimony of John the Baptist this morning. But wait, there's more. Look at it here, verse 35. Again, the third, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. I just, did he say that every time he saw him? <laughs> Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. Okay, get this scene in your mind. Go back to verse 35. It says, John stood with two of his disciples. Now there's something in here for me, kind of a Bible geek or nerd or something. I'm into this kind of thing. It says specifically that he stood there with two of his disciples. And later on in verse 40 of John chapter 1, he tells us who one of the two disciples was. One of the two disciples was Andrew. Who was the second of the two disciples? The best evidence we have, it doesn't say it was certainty, but the best evidence we have is that the second of the two disciples was John himself. This is where John the gospel writer got to meet Jesus. John the Apostle, John the Disciple. Here he is, right here, right now, meeting with Jesus, and he started out as one of the disciples of John the Baptist. John the Gospel writer and Andrew were both disciples of John the Baptist. And then one day, look at what it says there in verse 35, John stood with two of his disciples, John and Andrew, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. He told John, And he told Andrew, you look at Jesus. Look there at the Lamb of God. And then the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Verse 37 says that. Isn't that wonderful? They followed Jesus. Friends, this is really something wonderful about John the Baptist and his heart and his ministry. He did not really care about amassing followers after himself. He wanted people who would follow Jesus. So he was more than happy to say, you guys have been my followers. You've been my disciples. But you know what? Now is the time for you to go follow that man, the son of God, the lamb of God. So they came to Jesus. And when they came to Jesus, did you notice what Jesus asked them? Look at it. It's right there in verse 38. Jesus asked them, what do you seek? Do you realize in the gospel of John, these are the first recorded words of Jesus. I don't know how many of you have what would be called a red letter edition of the Bible. I have one right here. And I can tell it's the first words of Jesus because it's the first ones that are in red in my whole Gospel of John. Please, nobody should think that John actually wrote with a red pen and a black pen. (laughs) There's a little bit of interpretation going on here. But these really seem to be the first words of Jesus recorded in the Gospel of John. And notice what he says. He asks a question that was relevant not only to those disciples, but it's relevant to every man and woman who walks the earth today. What do you seek? What are you looking for? What are you looking for? You could say that the whole story of humanity is that we seek after things And we seek after things, sometimes in a wrong way, sometimes in a right thing, way. But God has desired to fulfill the deepest longings of our heart in him. I don't know what you're really seeking for in life. I'm seeking for success. I'm seeking for security. I'm seeking for safety. I'm seeking for love and romance. 
And there are people who live their entire lives seeking after those things. And this is what I'm trying to tell you. Those things aren't bad in and of themselves. But what you're really seeking after is something very basic, something very primal that God himself has put in your heart. You're seeking after him. I'm seeking success so that I can validate myself and know that I mean something, that I have a place in this world, that I'm not just a nobody. Friends, you can find all the success you want in the career world and still be empty, but in Jesus, you'll find your true significance. No, what I'm looking for is security. I don't want to have to worry about the future. I don't want to have to fret about every day. I don't want to have to live in fear that what's going to happen next week or if the stock market crashes or if there's a great earthquake or a fire. I want security in my life. Listen, there's nothing on this earth that's going to provide you real security apart from knowing that the God who rules the universe is taking care of you. You see, that need that you have, God intended it to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. No, 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 what I'm seeking after is love. And and so I find myself very prone to romance. I find myself very prone to relationships. And maybe some of those relationships are good. Maybe some of them are unhealthy or maybe even misguided. Listen, that instinct that you have for love, God means it to be satisfied ultimately in Jesus Christ. And that relationship that you can have with the living God. And you know, there's something wonderful that happens is that when we have that base need, the the, the base need for success, for security, for romance, when we have those basic needs satisfied in Jesus, then it's as if we're safe to go into the world and find whatever success God has for us in this world and find whatever security God might have for us on this earth to find whatever love or romance that he has for us. But the key is to get those things satisfied in Jesus first. So you see what a powerful question this was from the Savior to these two disciples, John and Andrew, verse 38, what do you seek? And then look at how Jesus answered them basically in verse 39. He said to them, come and see. You know, when they wanted to know more about Jesus, Jesus did not refer them back to John the Baptist. Well, you know, you want to know about me? Well, this John the Baptist fellow seems to know a lot about me. Go ask him more. He didn't do that. He said, you want to know more about me? You're going to have to connect with me on a personal level. Friends, this principle reminds me of one of the limitations that I have as a pastor, as a leader among God's people, as a person that's concerned for your spiritual growth. It makes me aware of the limitation I have and that there's only so much I can do. There's only so much I should do. Look, if there was something I could do, if I could preach the ultimate sermon or lead the ultimate Bible study and it would bring great spiritual maturity instantly into your life, man, I'd do it. But you know what? At the end of the day, I can only do what John the Baptist did. I connect you with Jesus and then Jesus speaks to you individually and he says, you connect with me. Come and see, dwell with me. That's where the depths of the Christian life are found. I'm not here to be your priest your mediator between you and God. I'm not here to be your guru, but I am here to be the one who points you again and again and again. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Go and meet with Jesus. Come and see with him. Going on now, verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Okay, the two original disciples there were John and Andrew. They were started out being disciples of John the Baptist. John the Baptist sent them to Jesus and great. Now they're on Jesus's crew. They're, they're studying under him. And then one of those two men, Andrew, what did he do? Verse 41, he found his own brother. You know, this is really wonderful about Andrew. Not only here, but the three mentions we have of Andrew in the Gospel of John, each time he's bringing somebody to Jesus. Andrew brought his brother Peter to Jesus. Then Andrew brought a little boy to Jesus. That was with the feeding of the 5,000. Then Andrew brought Greeks to Jesus when they were seeking after him. Every time you see Andrew, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. And friends, this should be us. 
There should be something in us that says, Jesus Christ has done something wonderful in my life. I want other people to have it. Do you realize that this has been the story of the Christian church throughout the centuries? This is how most people come to faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, I don't know the statistics. I'm not even going to try to paint a statistical picture for you. But look, I believe that preachers have their work. I certainly hope so. I I believe that media has its work. I believe that everything in this world God can use to bring somebody to Jesus is a wonderful thing. But I will say this, most people come to Jesus Christ because somebody they know, somebody who loves them, has invited them and said, just like Andrew, come and see, come and meet my Savior. Because there's the testimony, verse 41, we have found the Messiah. This is what Andrew says about him. He's the Messiah, the long-expected Savior of Israel and the world. Then verse 43 The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. He found Philip, and he said to follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Well, this is sort of unusual, isn't it? He just walks up to a guy and says, hey, you, follow me. I think there's probably some people in this room, you had a similar experience with Jesus Christ. You were just doing your thing, living every day, doing things, and then somehow, in some way, Jesus Christ has got a hold of your life, and you said, hey, you, follow me. And you did. That was Philip's story. Now going on here, verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. So Philip would say, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. Now he finds another person. He speaks to Nathanael, and he says, we found the one, him of whom Moses in the law and also all the prophets wrote. This man who's the great expectation of all the prophets of the Old Testament, I found him. I met him. I know that he's the one. He's Jesus of Nazareth. And did you see Nathanael's reply in verse 48? It's really wonderful. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, Nazareth was not a particularly evil or wicked city. Nazareth was more just nowheresville. It was nothing. It was completely insignificant. Not mentioned once in the Old Testament. Not mentioned once in Josephus. Not mentioned once in the intertestamental writers. It's completely absent because this is nowheresville. How could God bring anything good from there? And you know what? That prejudice against Nazareth almost turned Nathaniel away from him. But did you see Philip's brilliant reply in verse 46? He simply says, come and see. I'm not going to argue against your anti-Nazareth prejudice. You just come and meet him. You come and meet him and see for yourself. Don't discount him right away because he's from Nazareth. You come and see, and Nathanael did. Look, this is what happens here in verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, and he said to him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So Nathanael, the one who had been prejudiced against Jesus because he came from Nazareth, he starts walking towards Jesus. And what does Jesus say? The first thing he says to him, he says, notice it in verse 47. Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. You know, I love that phrase. He looked at Nathanael and he said, Nathanael, I see something wonderful in you. You're an Israelite and there's nothing deceitful in you. You know one way to, you could express that in our modern way of speaking? He looked at Nathanael and he said, you are a man who doesn't wear a mask. And Jesus was impressed by that. I think Jesus is impressed by people who don't wear masks. Because a lot of us find ways to put them on. You may have one on right now. Come on, it's your church mask. You put it on in the parking lot, you keep it on all the way through here, and you know to keep it on until you get back to your car. Right, there's something to that, isn't there? Friends, um, Jesus is impressed when we put away our masks and we just say, this is who we are. This is who I am, Jesus. This is the real me. It might be your habit, and I'm just using this as an example. It might be your habit to speak freely in a profane or cursing way outside when you don't have your church mask on. 
You know, you, you just speak in ways that, that you would never speak in here. Well, you know what? I don't want you to speak this way in here, but I don't mind the honesty. If that's who you are, then that's who you are, and then let's deal with it before God. Let's just be real. I, I shudder to think what conversation might be like at the end of this church service. <laughs> so I don't want to get hung up on this specific thing, but do you know what I'm saying? Jesus was impressed in Nathaniel that the mask was put away. And if you put away your mask, maybe we'll go, whoa. But then we'd say, you know what? We love you. We care about you. We want to see God work in your life just like we want to see him work in my life. That's what impressed Jesus about Nathaniel. And notice how blown away he was. Verse 49, he says, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. This was the testimony of Nathaniel regarding Jesus. And Jesus was so impressed by this. And I got to think that almost these two verses Jesus said with a laugh in his voice. Verse 50, Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You'll see greater things than these. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you will see heaven open. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You're blown away that I told you this? Listen, let me tell you something, Nathaniel. You're going to see greater things than these. And what you're going to see is you're going to see that I am the way to heaven. That's what he's doing. Jesus is drawing on an image from the Old Testament in the book of Genesis where Jacob saw a ladder going to heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending upon that ladder and Jesus is telling him, I am that ladder. You go to heaven upon me, not upon your own effort, not upon how good you are, but I am the way to heaven. You're gonna see that and you're gonna be blown away by that. Friends, when I think about this whole second section of, first, of the first chapter of the Gospel of John, I'm impressed by two things. Now wrap up with this. First of all, I'm impressed at how many different ways people come to Jesus. Did you notice that? Andrew came to Jesus because of the preaching of John. Peter came to Jesus because of the witness of his brother. Philip came to Jesus because of the direct call of Jesus. And Nathaniel came to Jesus as he overcame personal prejudice and met Jesus for himself. I just love the different ways that God draws people to Jesus. And there is no one way. You know, sometimes on a Sunday morning, we'll give a direct invitation and ask people who want to receive Jesus to come forward. And that's a wonderful thing, but you know, that's not the only way people come to Jesus. People come to Jesus in many different ways. The important thing is that you come, is that you put your trust in him is that you recognize what these other people recognize, that he is the Son of God. Because notice the testimonies that the different people give regarding Jesus. John the Baptist said, this man is eternal. He is the Son of God. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Andrew testified. He looked at Jesus and he said, this is the Messiah, the Christ of Israel. Philip testified that this is the one prophesied in the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament points forward to him. And Nathaniel testified. He said, this man is the son of God. He's more than a man. John had his testimony about Jesus. Philip had his testimony. Nathaniel had his. Andrew had his. What's your testimony about Jesus Christ? If somebody were to ask you, who is Jesus? You say, well, well, I could give you, you know, and you start giving historical facts and biblical facts. No, no, no. Who is Jesus to you? What has he meant in your life? How has he touched your life? How has he worked in you? Each and every one of us should have our own testimony of Jesus Christ. My prayer for you and for myself is that God would confirm us in that and give us all a good a properly, a personally powerful testimony of who Jesus is.